you should need my life, come and take it. Words from a fictional novel by the fictional writer Tregoran in The Seagull by Anton Chekhov. In Act 3, this line from this fictional book has a lot of consequences. Join me, please, as we look in detail at Act 3 of The Seagull by Anton Chekhov. I'm Nathan Thomas, and I'm professor of theater at Alvernia University in Reading, Pennsylvania. I'm so glad to welcome you back to this detailed look at Act 3 from The Seagull by Anton Chekhov. Under normal circumstances, probably we'd say, pour yourself a cup of tea from the samovar and make yourself at home. But for this act, maybe you want to have a shot of vodka. Act 3 from The Seagull is an interesting act. It's the one act of the play in which Dr. Dorn does not appear. It is also an act in which the meat of the act are three encounters that Madame Arcadena, the actress, has with three men in her life. First, her brother Soren, then her son Treplev, and then her lover, Tregoran. But before that, we have Tregoran having a conversation with Masha, and we have brief encounter with Nina, and then after Arkadina has her encounter with three men, we have a chunk where everyone is uh, in helter-skelter working for Arkadina and Tregoran to be leaving the country estate. So we have quite a journey ahead of us. Buckle up, let's go. And where we start, of course, is this uh, meal encounter between Masha and Tregoran. There are a couple of things I'd like to point out even before we get to the dialogue. Number one, please note that Masha starts each act of the seagull. Masha is a very interesting character. We'll learn more about her again in Act 3. We'll learn even more about her in Act 4 and how she feels about things. But also we learn that she is in many ways a comic character. And I want to talk about that for a moment. Uh, and then we'll talk also a little bit about this, the setting for this, uh, for the beginning of the act. Masha, uh, when we first are introduced to her in Act 1, it's in a conversation with Medvedenko. Medvedenko says, why is it you always wear black? And when we talked about Act 1, I said it's not always clear to me that Masha must always wear black, but it is clear that she is a gruff person. She's a rough person. She is someone who is willing to say things and think things, and she is in a place and a time that probably don't well suit her. And it's interesting that this play is being written at the tail end of the 19th century, but Masha's character is not only a gruff character, but she's also, in many ways, a comic character, and meant to be a funny character. In Act 2, her foot falls asleep, and so we see her do physical comedy. The actress who plays her, clumping off stage, trying to wake up her, uh, her foot that's asleep. And here at the top of Act 3, we see her uh, having a liquid meal of vodka. We'll talk more about the meal in a second. But here she is, she's drinking vodka, and it seems apparent from the context of the conversation, that she is more able to hold her liquor than Mr. Tregoran. So she is someone who is held out as, as someone who can provide humor, but also someone who has uh, a certain amount of tragedy and sadness in her life. And at the tail end of the 19th century in Russian arts and letters, there is the development of a of a reawakening of an interest in the Commedia dell'arte characters from the Italian Renaissance, and a sp specific interest in the character of Perrault. Perrault is the sad clown. If you have ever gone to a curio shop and you've seen uh, the white-faced clown with two little teardrops on their cheeks, you're looking at a, a variation on the Perrault figure, the Perrault icon the sad clown. And to some extent, I think that Chekhov was very interested in Masha, not a male, but a female, 
taking up the mantle of the sad clown. I don't think it was explicit. I don't know that necessarily that was in his mind, but certainly it is of a piece with the culture and where it was going in that time. It's going to happen before very long after this play is premiered that other great writers and directors are going to be examining the Perrault character. Meyerhold, who played Treplev in the Moscow Art Theater production of The Seagull, uh, in just a few short years, in 1906, he's going to be uh, doing a symbolist play by Alexander Bloch, in which he plays as an actor-director. He's going to play the character of Perrault explicitly in that play. And so it's something of the culture at this time in this place. And so is Masha the sad clown? Well, she certainly does provide humor, and we'll look at that in a second. And she certainly has a certain element of sadness or tragedy in her life, as do most of these characters. Next, I want to talk about the setting. In the first two acts, we've been outdoors. First, the wide open setting of the lakeside. In the second act, we moved to the cro croquet lawn, got closer to the house. Here, we're actually in the house itself, in Soren's dining room. And there's a buffet, a medicine cabinet. In the middle of the room is a table with some chairs, as one would find in a dining room. There's a trunk, some hat boxes, signs of preparation of leaving. Tregoran has finished lunch. Now, the interesting thing here is, what is the meal that they're eating? And as I've said before, as we've been talking about this play, I continually learn new things about this play. And in preparing for this uh, talk today, I found out that the Russian word, as I've, I've looked, can stand in for both breakfast and lunch. Now, it is, all, it is true that uh, nearly uniformly, amongst people who have translated Seagull into English, is that most of them have said that this meal is lunch. However, it might also be breakfast. Now, in my translation, which you can find online, I opted with most of my colleagues to say it's lunch, but maybe that is, uh, we're socially saving both Masha and Tregorin here, and probably more Masha than Tregorin. But it's highly possible that we might be looking here at breakfast, and that Masha is having for want of a better word, the breakfast of champions. Some vodka to wake her up in the morning. A little bit of the hair of the dog, what bitter, as they say. And Masha is having a drink. And as we find out, this drink that she is having as we start this conversation in, in mid-go in mid um, is not probably her first. So that's why I say, as we explore Act 3, you might want to have a shot if you have one available. Now, Masha here, this is in some places straight up comedy writing. Here she goes. She sets it up herself. And she, you know, she's talking about Treplev. In between Act Two and Act Three, there has been the difference of about a week. We find out about a week has passed. And in that period of time, Treplev attempted suicide, but only in the attempt grazed his temple. And so he's alive. He may or may not be well, but he's certainly alive and not terribly physically damaged. But in reference to this, Masha says, I swear to God, if he'd hurt himself seriously, I wouldn't have gone on living another minute, but I'm getting more brave. I've made up my mind to tear the love out of my heart by the roots. How are you going to do that? I'm going to get married. <laughs> this is very clear humor here. I'm going to tear the love out of my heart by the roots. How? I'm getting married. And, and the, uh, the text is, I'll, I'll get married to Medvedenko. The school teacher? Yes. Is that necessary? Loving and waiting? Oh, no, no, I'm going to get married. No love involved, just responsibilities. Make me forget the past. Besides, it'll make for a change. Another drink for you? Haven't we had enough? And so you get the notion that Tregorin and Masha have had a few. Uh, Masha's view of marriage here is very interesting. She is going to use marriage to make her forget about her love. And we know from the end of Act One, her love is Konstantin Treplev. And she's going to use marriage to get out of that. Now, think about this. This is a young woman 
again, late teens, 18, 19, early 20s, 2021, 20, somewhere in that range of age, probably. And she's lived on this farm, helping care for it with her parents, Shemrayev and Paulina. Who has she observed all of these years in terms of married women? Her mother. Her mother, who has had an affair that's been ongoing in some fashion with Dr. Dorn. And Masha's available models for looking at marriage, particularly within her own family, is not one that you get married for love. It's just not how she was brought up. And it's not the, the family life that she is used to. And Masha says, well, there. And she pours another drink for herself and Mr. Tagorin. Now, don't look at me like that. Women drink all the time. Some of them are open about it like me. Most of them do it in secret. Again, Masha lives out in the country. There's not at this time and place a huge amount. There's no electronic media. There's no looking in the lives of people other than in books. And so in terms of live models, who are the women that she's talking about? The women who are also there on the farm with her are her mother, Paulina, the cook, maybe some other maids that, you know, are referenced, but we never really meet. And so these women who live out here on the farm, right? Most of them do it in secret. Oh, yes, they do. And it's always vodka or brandy. Is this a reference to her mother? And this gets to a very interesting thing that we'll be talking about more in Act 4. And this is something that I've observed not as a man, I've observed this as a man of women, since I'm not a woman myself, but from time to time I meet, I've met any number of women who their mother is their hero, they and their mother have wonderful relationships, but I've also, over the course of my life, met women who wanted nothing, absolutely nothing to grow up to be like their mother. And so consequently, is Masha of this sort? Is she someone who is looking at the prospects of her life and thinking, I don't want to have a life like my mother's life, and so I want to do anything that's the opposite of that. But then on the other hand, she is thinking about getting married to Medvedenko, her schoolmaster, because that will help her forget the true love of her life. It's a very complicated uh, person, this Miss Masha. Uh, Tregorin, we find out uh, Tregorin is going to be leaving with Arkadina, and Tregorin says, I don't feel like going, and of course we know he, why he wants to stay, is he's interested romantically in Nina. And so if he's here, he'll have some level of access to his girlfriend's son's girlfriend. Just keep that in mind. No, she doesn't want me to stay. Her son's acting crazy. And here we know that from what Masha said in the first speech of the act, now we're talking about Treplev. Her son's crazy. First he shoots himself. Now he wants to fight a duel with me. What's the point? He pouts and snorts and preaches about new art forms. There's plenty of room for all the forms you want. Why fight about it? Now, it's interesting here that Trigorin takes... Uh, Treplev's interest in him as a matter of literature, not as a matter of, of, of personal interest here. And so Tregorin has not considered the fact, or publicly is not articulating, that he has any interest in Nina. You say, oh, this is about art. He's jealous of me as a writer. Well, Treplev may or may not be jealous of of Tregorin as a writer, but certainly Treplev is interested in whether or not Nina is interested in Tregorin. Now, during this conversation, Yakov is helping out by getting things ready for Arkadina and Tregorin's exit from the house. And so the question is, is, is what is Tregorin willing to say in public, that is to say in front of this, the servants, and what is he willing to, or how much does he pay attention to that? We do not know. And there are two answers to that question. There are some people who are very aware 
of the servants going back and forth and very aware that the servants listen and the servants talk. And there are some people who live in a way that, oh, the servants are here, the working people are here, but uh, they really don't matter, so I'll say pretty much anything. And so the question is, is to what degree Tregoran is aware of that, and will that affect what he says? Masha gets up, she decides to go. She says, I'm grateful to you for being so nice. Send me your books. Be sure to autograph them. Only don't put with best wishes. Write to Masha, who doesn't know where she came from or why she goes on living. Goodbye. And so, again, we have that comedy from Masha, who, by all appearances, is a very pleasant person, but comes out with these very interesting things. And it's, it's rare that Masha doesn't get laughs with these in performance. Now we have a brief encounter with Nina and Tregoran, where she uh, asks him, odd or even, and it turn, you know, she shows her fists. He says, uh, even, and no, she only had one pea in her hand or a little pebble or something, because she is playing odds or evens. And she's trying to use that system to decide whether or not she should go to the big city and become an actress. And uh, Tregoran says, well, I can't give you advice about that. And Nina says, oh, I have a gift for you. Oh, thank you. That's so kind and thoughtful. And he accepts the gift, and it's a medallion. And he thinks, he says, I think of you. As I saw you about a week ago in your summer dress, we talked, and there lying on the bench was a dead white seagull. Yes, the seagull. Well, someone's coming. She says, well, if you can, talk to me. I just need two minutes of your time. I'll leave, please. And as she walks out, who should walk in, of course, but Arcadena, who, who says in French, pardon, because uh, she's unaware of to what degree there might have been a little conversation between Nina and her boyfriend. And so consequently, uh, she says, I think we've packed. I'm exhausted. Tregoran looks at the medallion and finds this inscription, Days and Nights, page 121, lines 11 and 12. Now, at this point, we learn a lot about Tregoran, because at this point, Yaakov says, Shall I pick, pack your fishing gear, too? And Tregoran says, Yeah, I'll need the fishing gear. You can give away the books. And so we learn pretty quickly that Tregoran is not all that interested in the literature part of his life, but extremely interested in the fishing part of his life. And he says, oh, do you have my books? Yes, and my brother's study. And he goes, and so he goes to find his book, Days and Nights, so that he can look at page 121, lines 11 and 12. And Arkadana now has a con the first of three conversations, and we learn more about the character and nature of Arcadena in her three male relationships, her brother, her son, and her lover. And so let's start first with her brother, Soren. <laughs> we learn about people through their relationships. In many ways, it's like life. In this instance, we'll see this woman, Arkadina, in, in relationship with her brother and her son and her lover. First, her brother, Mr. Soren. Soren is her older brother. If we take the text as gospel, Soren is in his early to mid-60s. Madame Arkadina is in her mid-40s. So there's the difference of about 20 years in their births. Were they children of the same mother? Or there don't, there don't seem to be any other children or siblings that they speak of, so it seems to be just the two of them at this stage in their lives. If they had other siblings that may have passed away or predeceased the play, they never speak of them, we never hear of them. Mr. Soren is something of a local swell. He was someone who never rose above a middle manager, but it appears that in the town that is associated or near his uh, country estate, 
that he is sometimes called upon for official events. And so he is going into town because they're laying, laying a cornerstone for the new city hall. And so as a local person of some note, they've invited him to come. Whether or not he will be actually speaking or just smiling and waving, sort of at the equivalent of a ribbon-cutting ceremony, is difficult to say. Uh, we get the notion that uh, Mr. Soren has never really enjoyed or done very well with public speaking, and so consequently it's probably the fact that he is there to make an appearance. And so he's getting ready for that. They're going to be bringing around the horses, and this is where this goes. Now, he starts talking to Arkadina about the young person in both their lives. Even though Treplev is Soren's nephew, we do get the feeling that, that uh, Soren has been a surrogate father for Treplev uh, for quite some time. And certainly Soren treats him that way, and to some degree Treplev treats Soren as a surrogate father. And so Soren is asking on Treplev's behalf of something to help the boy. Of course, he cares so much for him, the young fella, and uh, the attempted suicide has, has really scared him. And so he and Arkadina have a chat. Now, as we've said before, Madame Arkadina sometimes is made out to be this rather, um, can be made out to be a rather shrewish woman. Uh, certainly Treplev comments about her as if she's a miser. But we have to keep in mind all of the, the difficulties that Arkadina faces in her time and in her culture. In the time that Madame Arkadina lived, there were no social safety nets. There was nothing for the average person to do anything. The actors and actresses were in no way unionized. And so consequently, what we have is a time and a place where a woman who is entering middle age, someone who has previously had some level of success in her line of work, and there are very few that are available to her. So she's worked as an actress. She's had some success at it. But she's also getting older. And the parts that she has been playing all of her life are going to eventually not be available to her anymore. She was playing romantic heroines uh, and largely younger romantic heroines. And as she gets into the very clearly uh, matriarchal range, that's going to be harder and harder for her to successfully portray those on the stage. And as a consequence, what's going to happen is she's afraid she's going to get less and less work. And where's the money going to come from? Who is going to take care of her? And this is the challenge of Arkadina's life. She's responsible for all of her costumes, which means that she is responsible for knowing fashion, knowing what fashion looks good on her, and knowing how to make herself look like she's slightly younger than, uh, than her calendar age. She's responsible for all of that, and there is no one really to help her with that. She is the one who maintains Arcadena Inc., and with very little help, very little support, and knowing that it could all go away in a second. So this is a woman who lives in uh, a very, uh, very challenging uh, milieu. And we learn something about this in her conversation with Mr. Soren. And so, you know, she says, I, I want you, to her brother, I want you to take care of my son. I suppose the main reason he did what he did was jealousy, and I'm going to take Tagorin away from here. And Soren says, well, jealousy, yeah, but there are some other parts to this. You understand he's an intelligent young man, and here he is out in the country with me. I'm an old man. I am not anything that he needs to hang out with. He needs to go have an adventure. He needs to go have a life. And he's not going to find it out here in the country on my farm. So could you give him some money? He could go into Europe. He could travel. He could see a little bit of the world. He could live in the city. Or if you can't do that, at least get him some new clothes so that he looks more presentable. You know, maybe a, a new jacket. And Arkadina says, well, I could manage the new suit. Going abroad, well, I, I could, couldn't pay for that. I can't afford the new suit. I don't have money. And Soren laughs. And she says, I don't. And he starts to whistle.
Now, this is an interesting little thing. Of course, we've seen throughout the play already Dr. Dorn using music as a means to deflect and diminish interest and to push bits of the conversation into other places to give himself time to think. And so here Soren does it as well. Just a little whistle. And then says, oh, it's all right. Now, dear, don't get upset, please. Everyone knows, everyone knows you're a generous, unselfish woman. I don't have the money. And Soren says, well, I'd like to give him some of my money, but I don't have any money. You know, what little pension I get goes into the farm and it gets eaten away, as farming does. And Arcadina says, well, I have a little money, but I'm an actress and I've got to keep up. And that's when Soren has a spell. We don't know the nature of the spell, but part of it is is that he's an older fellow in his time and place. The uh, lifespan, life expectancy for a gentleman of his age and background was not much longer or older than the early 60s. And so he has a spell and feels that he might fall down. And of course, as, a, as you get into your older years, falling down is something which is not... Uh, an adventure that we like to have. And so this is something that is very scary on its own. And so Arcadina sees her brother have this spell and yells out for help. And who comes on, of course, but Treplev and Medvedenko. Medvedenko, of course, is here looking for Masha. Evidently, he's not needed in the schoolhouse today. And Treplev, of course, is here and available. Treplev is wearing a bandage, and they help Soren, and Soren regains himself and, of course, feels like he doesn't need to be nursed or be babied and pampered in any way, as an older gentleman, you know, would probably naturally do. And that's when Medvedenko comes off with this thing and all of a sudden says the riddle of the Sphinx. You know, have you heard this one? Um... You know, that what creature is it that starts the day on four legs, in the middle of the day is on two legs, and in the uh, evening is on, uh, and he starts to finish the sentence, and Soren says, yeah, and at night, flat on his back, I heard that one before. I can handle myself, and Medvedenko says, no, no, don't make a fuss. And the two of them leave together. And so... You also get then a little bit of a taste of a notion that Medvedenko and Soren also have a little bit of a relationship with each other because Treplev doesn't uh, get in the way. He doesn't say it's like, yes, Medvedenko's here. He knows Soren well enough. The two of them can get on fine without me. And now we move to the second of the three encounters that Madame Arkadna has with the men in her life, the encounter with her son, Treplev. The encounter between Arkadina and her son Treplev centers around her changing his dressing. As Treplev himself said in Act 1, his mother is really a very good nurse, very tender and helping to care for people. And so this is something that Madame Arkadina does very, very well indeed. And so she asks her son to sit down and she starts to change the dressing. In the production done by the Moscow Art Theatre, this scene was one of constant motion between the two of them in terms of Madame Arkadna getting, uh, um, getting a dish that has some water in it, uh, getting a rag put together so that she can uh, clean the wound, make sure that everything is fine, and then put a new dressing uh, on the wound. And uh, normally the doctor would do it, Treplev says, but the doctor is not here for whatever reason. And so consequently, please, Mom, would you take care of it? And so she does. And Arcadina says, fine, sit, and says, well, I'm away. Don't do anything silly like more bang, bang. And the, the notion is here is that whatever the, the words are, and different translators have used different, um, different sounds here, the onomatopoeia of it, you know, no more click, click, you know, people. No more with, with the gun. But it's interesting here, of course, as someone who is related to someone who has attempted suicide, is she herself is not able, she doesn't have the strength to be able to say, please don't 
don't use a gun again. She has to use this sort of child talk of no more with the bang bang, no more with the click click, whatever the translation is uh, that you happen to be looking at. Uh, mine, I chose bang bang. And Treplev says, no, no, no more of that. It was a moment of despair. I didn't have control for a moment. It won't happen again. And then he remembers a time back when she was working at the Imperial Theater, probably in the state capital, state capital in uh, St. Petersburg. And he was just a little kid at the time. There was a fight in the courtyard, and one of the other boarders, a washerwoman, was beaten unconscious. Do you remember? You, you got medicine for her, and you cared for her children. Don't you remember? Nope. And don't you remember there were two ballerinas who used to also dance at the theater? Don't you remember them? Oh, I remember them. They were very religious. And then he says, the past few days, I've loved you the way I did when I was little. But then there's this guy. Why do you let yourself fall under the influence of this man? Now, Treplev has a, a large number of particulars against Trigorin. One is, I think that uh, Treplev, uh, given that she uh, is no longer with his father, that might be some issue of it, uh, that uh, she's with a younger man, that Tre uh, Trigorin, whatever his age is, is closer in age probably to Treplev than he is to Arkadama. That may be upsetting to him. But I think, of course, also... The notion that his mother's boyfriend is making a play for the woman he loves has got to really hurt him and say, this guy is, is just not behaving nicely. He's, he's not doing anything to, to, to stop this attention. He's, he's a dog. Why are you still with him? And Madame Arcadena says, oh, you don't understand him. He's, he's very noble. He's got a noble character. And Treplev gets upset at this. What's so noble about this guy? There's nothing, there's nothing about this. We're quarreling over him in here. He's probably in the, dark, the dark drawing room of the garden laughing at us and twisting Nina's mind, trying to convince her he's a genius. And, of course, Treplev does not care at all for Trigorin and the nature of the work that Trigorin does as an artist, so that contributes to it. And this starts this... Um, this argument between Arkadina and Treplev. And what happens is, is that Treplev gets very close to pressing some of Arkadina's buttons, and they're her buttons because she's very concerned about her future. Uh, she has, she's, she's living in a place where she's very uncertain about what's going to happen. And Treplev says, I have more natural talent than the rest of you. You and your routine friends, you've taken over everything artistic. You think the only legitimate thing is your own work. Anybody different, you shut them up. And she calls her son a decadent. And he says, you can go back to your second-rate theater and act in your second-rate plays. Now, this is very frightening to Madame Arcadena. She's been someone who's been towards the front rank of, of actors, and the notion that to be second rank is sort of the fall off. You know, I can't play the young romantic leads anymore on the legitimate stage because they'll be able to find, of course, young women who can do that. It's a little bit about like all about Eve. You, you know, there's got to be something that's going on there. But then what happens is... Uh, she says, I've never done anything second rate. That's not going to happen. And then says, you couldn't be in anything even third rate, you middle class provincial, you parasite, skinflint, beggar. And they go back and forth like this, and it causes Treplev to cry. And when he starts to cry, like any mother, she feels very upset and upset about their argument. Now, this is one of those things which we know, but sometimes is something that we don't think about, which is our most terrible arguments and the terrible things that we say to each other are often with people that we love. You know, if you're in, in a convenience store anywhere and you're waiting to you know, buy a pack of gum and you're upset by a stranger, by someone you don't know, it's not that upsetting because you'll never see them again, most likely. On the other hand, the most strident arguments that you've probably had in your life are arguments that you've had 
with people that you love. And so whenever I teach this play, I remind my students of this, is that these people have really terrible arguments that are really hurtful, but they're uh, able to be hurtful because these are arguments among people who truly, truly do love each other. And so Madame Arcadena says, please, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. And of course, she said it, and she said it in a way that did mean it. And of course, that hurt Treplev. And of course, Treplev is so concerned about the loss of the love of his, his love, Nina, and doesn't know who to talk to. I mean, who would you talk to about this? Normally, you would talk to, right? There's no one for Treplev there to talk to. He talks to his mother, but it's his mother's boyfriend, and she just defended him. So what is he going to do? He grabs his bandages, and he walks out. And that takes us to Arkadina's third encounter with the men in her life. She's had an encounter with her brother. Her brother Soren had a, had a spell and nearly fainted and fell in front of her. She's had an argument with her son, which caused them to call each other names that really hurt each other. And now in comes her lover, Tregorin. And this encounter will be the topper of the three. that Arkadina has had her encounter with her son and that argument, we find out that Trigorin had time to go to the study, wherever that was in the house, and find the right book from his collection of, of, of novels, um, and found it and brought it back. And when he brings it back, he looks up the page and he looks at the lines. Page 121, lines 11 and 12, that's it. If ever you should need my life, come and take it. Arkadna, who still is not keyed into what is going on with her lover, at this point says, the carriage will be here soon. If ever you should need my life, come and take it. You're packed, yes. And he thinks for a moment and he says, let's stay. Now, there's only one reason for him to change his mind and say, let's stay at this point, and it is Nina. So, Arkadina starts in saying, you know, you're infatuated with Nina. I get that, but you can't, you can't let an infatuation like that become something that overwhelms you or leads you into doing something that you're going to regret later. And that's when Tregorin comes in and says, no, uh, I, I, I want this. And, he's, and he says this, which is very strange. When I was young, I never had the time. I was always working to be published, trying to earn a living. And now it's here. It's calling to me. How can I run from it? You're out of your mind. So what? And Arkadina says something, given her situation this day, says, you are all conspiring to torture me today. And she begins to cry, and he says, you don't understand, you don't want to understand. And here, Tregorin is asking a lot of Arkadina to say, to essentially, in a, in a very flat way, which is, this is why they're not, uh, you know, stultifying... Uh, Victorian British people. These are people who are saying, look, I've got an opportunity with this girl. I, I want to take it. You don't understand, but that's really something very bold to tell your lover. And we don't know how long that Mr. Tagoran and Madame Arcadena have been together, but uh, it's still an awfully bold thing to say uh, to her. And you might say, well, it's not as bold as it could be, but within the range of what is allowable through official censorship, as the Tsarist government had at the time that Chekhov wrote the play is, it's really quite a lot. It's, it's very bold, it's very candid, it's very clear that what it is that Trigorin is asking her. 
And it's in this moment of time that we begin to understand this relationship between Arkadana and Tregoran. What Arkadana gets out of this relationship, we have sort of known since Act One. And that is what Arkadana gets out of this relationship is that she gets the romance of a younger man and that she is still attractive to a younger man and that she can hold on to a younger man. But the question then is, well, what does Tregoran get out of this relationship? And in this moment, we see precisely what Tregoran gets out of this relationship. She says, am I so ugly and old you can talk to me like this about another woman? And then she kisses his hands. My treasure, my foolish love. You want to destroy yourself, but I don't want you to. I won't let you. You're mine. You're mine. This face is mine. These eyes are mine. Your beautiful silken hair is mine. You're all mine. You're so talented, so smart. You're the greatest writer alive. You're the only hope of Russia. You have such truth, such simplicity, such freshness, such a vital sense of humor. One line, that's all it takes, and you have it all. You create living human beings to read you as a triumphant experience. You think I'm exaggerating? I lie. Look into my eyes. No, no, look into him. Do I look like a liar? You know I'm the one person who knows how to appreciate you. My darling, my wonderful darling, you'll come with me, won't you? You won't ever leave me, will you? And we see the tools by which she holds on to Tregoran. It's not the physicality of their uh, intimate physical relationship. It is her ability to give him the esteem and the adoration that fulfills something for him. And you see this in his own admission, where he says, I have no will of my own. I've never had an ounce of will. I'm flabby and weak and submissive. How could that be attractive to any woman? Go on, take me away with you, but please don't let me out of your sight. Now, in some productions, they cut this little aside from Arkadana, but I think it's perfectly acceptable where she says, he's mine. And then, of course, she uses the reverse psychology to make sure that, in fact, he is lashed to her. Oh, you can stay if you want. You could come later. No, 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 I'm coming with you. And so we have seen in these three encounters, Madame Arcadena with her, with her brother, her son, and her lover, and the depths of what this woman has in her, in terms of dealing with how is she going to deal with her family when her brother, who is having spells and falling, how is she going to deal with that? How is she going to deal with her son, who is no longer going to have a surrogate father if her brother passes away? And then how do I deal with my lover, who is attracted in so many ways to my son's love. And this woman deals with all of these things in this incredible time of about, you know, not 30 minutes of time. And we see all of the surprising places that this woman lives inside her heart, inside her mind, inside her soul. And again, with very short words. We have a, a little bit of a lengthy speech here where Arkadana is working to hold on to Tregoran, but the language is not particularly high-flown or uh, poetic, but yet there is the poetry of the reality of human experience that somehow Chekhov is able to give a voice to and gives voice to it through this very complicated woman, Arkadana. Now, once we get to this point, they've decided they're going to go. The uh, servants, Yakov, and if anyone is assisting Yakov, has all the luggage out. They're getting that outside to put on the cart. And, of course, this is where things are going to uh, pick up for the end of the show. Shemrayev shows up. He says, I have the honor with deep regret 
to announce, dear lady, the horses are ready. And he says, no, we've still got a few minutes, so let me tell you a story. Let's chat for a few minutes because we won't have to leave for another five minutes. Shamrayev is one of those kinds of guys. And he tells a decidedly terrible old joke uh, that has a terrible bad pun in it. And I'll let you read that for yourself. But as Shemrayev finishes that joke, of course, is the only one who laughs at it out loud himself and repeats the punchline because he loves it so much. This is one of the few jokes that he tells. He loves it. He tells it and retells it. As he finishes, Yakov fusses with the luggage. The maid brings Arkad under her hat, shawl, umbrella, gloves. They all help Arkad in a dress for traveling. The cook appears and enters hesitantly. Paulina enters, followed by Soren and Medvedenko. So this is a very traditional family farewell within the culture. Everyone is going to come. Paulina has a, a little basket of fruit that she's going to give to Arkadina. And then they start to cry about, oh, we're, we're so sorry uh, that we didn't do more for your visit. They uh, want to say there's something to this. And Arkadina says, well, okay, I just want to go. Don't don't get too much going here. And Soren says, oh, it's time to go. Uh, it's hard for me to get in, so I'm going to go ahead and get in the carriage. I'm not going to be part of this. And then Arkadina does, of course, and, and Chekhov here has given us reasons to be sympathetic to Arkadina, but now also turns that around for comic pur purposes. Is she's going to give a little tip. She's going to give a little bit of a gratuity to uh, the servants. And so she gives Paulina, or the cook, whoever is there, and, uh, oh, she hands the cook a ruble. And, and it's, uh, it's not a lot of money. And then she says, here's a ruble. And by the way, it's for all y'all to split up. You can do that, can't you? And so consequently, we have a little bit of humor here. And Arkadna repeats it again in a minute where someone, you know, catches her eye. She's like, no, I, I, I gave the cook a ruble. It's, it's for all of you all. Um, take care. Au revoir. And she and Dragorin are out. Now, under normal circumstances, this would be the end of the act. There's nothing left here uh, but to ring down the curtain. And there's a little incident here, again, as a little coda that's almost like a piece of music, where we're going to have this little bit at the end, and um, the question is, is whether or not it's been planned. And there have been productions that I've seen of The Seagull in which it looked as if this had been planned, and others in which it looked completely uh, accidental. And to my eye and thought is that this was not planned, is that at the tail end of his conversation with Arkadina, Dragorin was going to get on to the, on, get to the horse, they're going to go to the train station, they're moving to town, and he's going to do everything he can. He's not going to worry about Nina ever again. But he happened to forget his walking stick, and he happened to remember that he forgot his walking stick. And as one does when one's getting ready to go, decides, well, I've, I've forgotten my walking stick, I should go back and get it which he does, and of course, as he does, sees Nina again. Not for two minutes, but for about 45 seconds. And in this 45 seconds, so much happens. Nina says, I knew we'd meet again. Boris Alexievich, I've made up my mind. The die is cast. I'm going to go on the stage. I'm starting a new life. I'm leaving like you. I'm going to go to Moscow. I'll see you there. And Trigorin says, stay at this nice hotel called the Slavyansky Bazaar. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice hotel at, at, at Chekhov's time. And uh, it had a hotel restaurant, which was very famous for the people there in uh, Moscow to go and have business lunches and so forth. And she wants to keep him just one more minute. And he says, oh, you're so beautiful. It's wonderful. We'll see each other soon. She puts her head on his chest. I'll see your lovely eyes again then sweet, tender smile, that look of angelic purity, my darling, and they kiss. And so ends the third act of The Seagull, where we thought the, uh, the lives of these people were going to go, to one, go one way, all of a sudden, because of a walking stick, everything is now back up in the air. 
and we will find what happens uh, with that when we come back for Act 4. We have a little bit of time at the end of this session. I've uh, since been doing this each day. We've gotten comments, and I'd like to reply to a few of the comments that, that people have posted. At Sweet Betsy from Perk writes, uh, your Russian accent, when you say Russian names, and I have to admit that when I say words in Russian, I'm not going to go so far to say I'm speaking Russian because what happens is, is when I say words in Russian, I do it with my native Midwestern American accent. And I know that I do, and I keep working on it and, and hopefully uh, keep improving with that. At Ivan the Less Than Terrible 1999 asks, had he lived, what else would Chekhov have written, do you think? That's a very good question. Chekhov, of course, as one knows, he died far too young. and uh, But he did leave notebooks and he left notes. And there is evidence that he left uh, the idea in his notes for uh, the possibility of a play about some people waiting for someone who never shows up. And so one wonders, had uh, Chekhov not had tuberculosis and died when he did, would it be possible that Chekhov would have essentially have written waiting for Gatto um, some good 40 years prior to Samuel Beckett having done so. It's an interesting thing to contemplate. Uh, but on the other hand, it may have been an idea that Chekhov would never have gotten to. And uh, he was a busy man all the time, as he said one time in a letter, one of my favorite uh, lines from Chekhov that's not in a play, is that he, he wrote his brother at one point and said he was so busy not enough time for a quiet fart. And the last question that we or comment that we have is from At Love's Theater and a very long number because I'm sure there are a lot of people at Love's Theater. And so there's a number there. And um, At Love's Theater notes that these chats are longer than the acts themselves. And yes, they are. And part of the reason for that is that um, we're hopeful that an unpacking the different possible meanings and resonances of all that happens in these acts inside the play The Seagull is that you uh, have a better sense of understanding the richness of the characters and so forth so that the next time that you see a production, you see all of the possibilities that the actors and directors sifted through and uh, understand the the depth and resonances of all that's going on on stage it's it's a it's a play that uh, like music or like poetry has deep resonances and as i said in our first session together it is a play with no bottom the characters are endless in terms of what they're what's possible for them and we'll certainly see this when we see them in act four thank you again for joining me on this journey through the Seagull by Anton Chekhov. Until I see you next time, stay safe.